All right, so David kind of alluded to my um, dissertation. And so what I, I did is I looked at um, kind of the Northern theater of the American Revolution. Um, so kind of 1775 through 1779, I looked at some major, uh, major campaigns that occurred during that time frame. Um, and made some novel uh, no novel arguments about them, and so we're going to talk about um, talk about some of those tonight. Uh, David saw me uh, walk in with a stack of blue books, and he says, "Oh no, the <laughs> professor is here to give exams." I uh, said, "No, I'm not giving exams." So I actually published this work in the Journal of Military History, which is kind of an international academic. Um, um, uh, research journal and they gave me tons of these off prints of my articles so um, before it actually um, went into journal form they do these uh, a little off print so um, I'm going to set these out front um, after my talk and y'all are more than welcome to uh, grab one on your way out if you are um, if you are so inclined um, the article kind of plays a big part of the backbone of um, of the talk I'm going to give tonight. So my talk kind of walks us through, I wanted to introduce the Arnold campaign, kind of put it in that broader historical context. And then I felt left out because I wasn't here last week to discuss Arundel. So I'm going to talk about Kenneth Roberts, talk about the book a little bit, um, talk about kind of my debt to Kenneth Roberts, because um, he compiled a lot of the journals. I don't know how many people here have um, seen his March to Quebec um, kind of uh, collection of journals. So I see a couple, um, couple hands go up. Yeah. So, um, I really owe a great debt to him because I was in class, um, and I, I needed a research topic. And so I discovered that, um, collection of diaries at Full Blue Library at the University of Maine. I saw, this is fantastic, right? All kinds of rich, um, rich resources um, in them. So, and then I'm going to launch into kind of my take on Arnold's March, which will probably be a little bit different from the standard uh, literature that maybe you are all uh, you are all familiar with. And then uh, I look forward to um, uh, questions and um, and whatever. So I was glad that uh, David thought of me for the Scout Eden Bicentennial series. I think this. Uh, uh, this kind of merges um, merges well with that, um, and so we're going to talk about some uh, talk about some interesting um, history. And I'm going to kind of complicate the prevailing narrative about how soldiers um, interact with the environments with which they serve. Um, most people, when they think about military history, they think about battles and movements and and things like that. But actually, most of a soldier's job isn't fighting. Most of a soldier's job is marching. It is building camp. It is uh, foraging. It is doing a whole bunch of other activities that isn't fighting, right? And so that is um, what we are going to get into um, tonight. And this is also timely because I'm teaching American military history at the university um, this semester. And I just got done talking about um, kind of my lectures on the Seven Years' War. And the um, and the American Revolution, so it's all kind of uh, uh, very um, timely. So I'm going to if I can get my clicker to work. Maybe I could point it this way. Uh, I can use the keyboard. Maybe I can't use the keyboard. Do I have to click on the window and then do it? Hey, look at that. Hey, now the clicker is working. Great. All right. So ah, uh, there we go. So at the close of the Seven Years' War, right, so we fight this very long conflict with um, France that actually it's a very unique conflict in that most of the wars in Europe, most of the big colonial wars happening start on in continental Europe and then bleed into the colonies. But the Seven Years' War, also known um, uh, in the Americas as the French and Indian War, really starts in the colonies. It starts in the Ohio country and then bleeds into the rest of the empire. So it's really a new dawn for um, how global warfare ends up um, occurring. And so at the close of the Seven Years' War, the colonists in the Americas are experiencing um, something that uh, historians term as Anglophilia, which is kind of a love of all things English, all things British, right? Um, and this spreads throughout the colonies. You know, they just defeated, they just casted off their long-standing enemy out of... Um, out of uh, North America, right? And so how does this all go wrong, right? How do we go from Anglophilia to the American Revolution in a very short um, short amount of time, in about 12 years? Well, 
to begin with, Britain has to pay for this war, right? And how do they pay for the war? Taxes, right? Um, so they start imposing taxes that actually some of them were already on the books, but they, they didn't really enforce them in the colonies. Um, the colonies really existed far away from a lot of imperial, uh, imperial power, imperial structure. And so they started enforcing those. And then they brought more, uh, more taxes and more taxes. And so then they said, wait a minute, we don't want to pay all these taxes out. Um, to pay for things uh, in the empire. Um, so if, if you're going to tax us, we want a seat in parliament, right? And Britain did not, was not willing to give, um, give the colonists a seat at the table. Um, and so then they start enforcing trade regulations. And then the British army wants to hold on to the territory they just got, right? So a lot of British regulars start streaming in to the American colonies and they need a place to stay. So they passed the Quartering Act. And so the Quartering Act basically said that soldiers needed to be put up in public buildings, but there's not a lot of public buildings. So once those fill up, they end up being quartered in private homes, which um, there's a long standing tradition in America of kind of um, uh, a history of suspicion of standing armies. So this caused a lot uh, a lot of conflict. So what we see here is kind of a mature colonial society that um, now after 100, 150 years, depending on the colony, the British empire is trying to put their thumb under and say, hey, we need money from you. Hey, we need all this stuff. And they said, hey, we've been living on the frontier kind of free and clear for about 100 and 150 years. Um, and so there's this, um, this uh, friction there that occurs. And then there's the proclamation line. So the, um, there's uh, a bunch of conflict with indigenous people around the Detroit area. Um, some of you might know it as uh, Pontiac's Rebellion or Pontiac's War that occurs at the close of the Seven Years' War. And so Pontiac basically says, hey, I wasn't at the, the uh, peace meetings in Paris. We're not giving up. Um, you know, the French surrendered, but we're not. And so there's all this conflict that occurs um, in this uh, Western land area between indigenous peoples and the British. And the British says, hey, we, we don't want to fight anymore. We just spent a ton of money on war. And so they decide that they need to create, uh, create some peace to uh, kind of smooth things over uh, because they don't have a whole, uh, whole lot of money. So they come up with this idea of a proclamation line where the areas to the east would be where the colonies are and the areas to the west would be um, kind of an indigenous reserve. Well, this really rubbed the colonists the wrong way because they fought over the land of the Ohio country, right? That is where the Seven Years War started. So um, this really, uh, the colonists really, um, uh, said, you know, we had family members who died, we've lost our fortunes, we lost all kinds of things trying to get this land, and now you're telling us we got to stay to the east of that proclamation line to keep peace. There was also a lot of colonial elites who had land speculation deals in the Ohio country. So one of the things that starts um, the Seven Years' War is George Washington is actually kind of exploring out there on behalf of Virginia um, and kind of surveying land, and he bumps a French... Um, uh, French detachment and they start fighting and then that kind of spirals things out of control. So there's a lot of elites who have land, uh, land speculation ideas of this country as well. So um, all of this really doesn't, um, doesn't bode well with the colonists between the taxation and everything else. So tensions start escalate, uh, escalating, we end up with political disagreements, uh, mob action, um, and then we end up with a confrontation that occurs before Lexington and Concord, where colonists try to seize powder stores in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, that somehow doesn't uh, devolve into armed conflict, but shortly after, um, in April, we end up with uh, uh, kind of the infamous or famous um, shot heard around the world at uh, Lexington and Concord, right? And that spirals into the siege of Boston. And then we have Benedict Arnold and a gentleman named Ethan Allen that capture some of these Western uh, forts. He captures Fort Ticonderoga. So we end up with all kinds of armed conflict that starts um, spiraling. And then politically, um, 
So we have, uh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so we have Lexington and Concord up top. We have the Battle of Bunker Hill uh, image down bottom. Um, and then we actually have, um, I found a map of uh, Fort Ticonderoga actually where um, Arnold and Ethan Allen end up, uh, end up taking. And so how do we get to the point where we invade Canada, right? So the revolution has started. So what's going on here? Well, the Continental Congress realizes the importance of Canada, right? They might be sympathetic to the American cause. They're recently put under uh, Britain, Britain's imperial rule, and the colonists are saying, the English colonists are saying, hey, this is, this is kind of a, a, a oppressive. Um, I bet the French really aren't liking this a whole lot either. So they thought, hey, you know, there's there's somewhere between 90 to 100,000 other colonists living uh, in um, the area which would um, eventually become Canada. Why don't we try to get them to come in as like the 14th rebellious colony? If we invade Canada, they might all help us out and they might pile in and then we'll, we'll have even more, um, even more, even more help. So the expeditions concocted as a single prong attack initially under the command of the gentleman on the left. So that's uh, General Philip Schuyler. And then we have General Washington on the right there. Um, and so they concoct this expedition to go up through a really well-traveled uh, invasion route um, where uh, the French invade into New York and then the uh, British invade up into Quebec um, so often throughout uh, periods of colonial, uh, colonial warfare. So they said, okay, we can invade up through here. We can get Montreal, take Montreal, and then take, um, take Quebec. Okay, so we have kind of a plan hatched. So how does Arnold get involved? So Arnold is hot off this expedition from Fort Ticonderoga. He's uh, rearing to go for more action. And so he actually actively lobbies to uh, become the commander of, um, of an Eastern prong of this expedition. So he goes to General Washington and he basically says, hey, look, there's this established invasion corridor up the Kennebec River, across the Dead River, um, into the Shogia River Valley, right? Um, if I do that, while Schuyler's in New York, we can kind of do this pincer movement. And then the Governor General of Canada is gonna have a choice to make, right? He's gonna have to choose do I defend Montreal or do I defend Quebec, right? And so Arnold's very convincing and he kind of sells Washington on this. Um, and he also says, hey, I got this map um, from a guy named John Montresor who surveyed the area, um, surveyed that river corridor. Um, and so Arnold said, I even, have, I even know where, you know, I know where I'm going. I know, uh, I know what to do here. The problem with Montresor's map, for those who are familiar, Montresor was surveying um, that river corridor uh, in the springtime uh, at high water, and he was doing it downstream. So he completely miscalculates, um, miscalculates the expedition, but Arnold is able to kind of sell this. He says, look, this is going to be great. We can have this two-pronged attack. So General Washington appoints Arnold. Um, the forces, uh, he gathers forces at Cambridge, Massachusetts. So the Continental Army is um, stationed in Cambridge during the Siege of Boston. So during the summer of 1775, Arnold's collecting people. And then he convinces the Massachusetts Committee of Safety to pay for the whole thing. So um, the Continental Congress uh, is kind of a loose confederation. You can really think of the 13 colonies in some ways as 13 separate countries that are kind of loosely bound uh, together. So Massachusetts, you know, they're, they're the real rabble rousers here. And they say, hey, we'll pay for this if you want to, uh, if you want to do this campaign. So the, he gets his financial support. He gets his political support um, from Washington. And then he has troops um, that he's able to, uh, to get in Cambridge. Okay. So why does the Continental Army and um, Continental Congress want to do this? Like, what's the real strategic aims here? Well, they want to capture Quebec. Well, why do they want to capture Quebec? Well, it, you can see where Quebec's situated on this map I made. Um, it's really this uh, uh, central location. So the main highways of the day are rivers, right? So Quebec really gives you access to uh, a lot of the interior parts of North America. Right, so they knew if they took Quebec, Britain would lose kind of those routes into uh, North America, and that uh, a lot of supplies are pouring into the colonies through uh, through Quebec as well. So they knew they would be able to kind of control that. They wanted to bring those Canadians into the fight, 
Um, so those uh, French that are under the thumb of Britain right now, they say, hey, we could get, we could get, you know, 10,000 of that or maybe more, we'll be, uh, we'll be in good business, right? Um, and so they wanted to weaken uh, kind of Britain's control in, um, in what would become uh, Canada. They also wanted to secure the Northern frontier, right? Um, so they're fighting in Boston. There's a lot of conflict that actually occurs outside of Boston. Boston kind of gets a uh, big, um, big name in the history books. There's a lot of rioting that's occurring in Philadelphia, in New York, uh, places like that. So they want to kind of secure those areas from Northern invasion as well. So there's all kinds of invasion routes into, say, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire from, uh, from Canada. So they want to um, kind of uh, disrupt that. They also want to take the initiative, right? So they've seized Fort Ticonderoga. They're doing pretty good in Boston. So they say, hey, we can kind of take, um, take the initiative here, take the British off guard and really disrupt their, uh, disrupt their plans. And then there's all kinds of armament and artillery and munitions and supplies in Quebec. And they said, hey, we just got a bunch of this stuff at Ticonderoga. Wouldn't it be great if we got um, even more? But one of the most important things is this bottom bullet point, and that is they wanted to end the conflict quickly. So the Declaration of Independence isn't signed for a whole nother year. It's not even um, really concocted at this point in time. And so what the Americans were fighting for was not independence at this point in time, but to secure their rights as Englishmen. So they wanted to end this thing quickly, tell Britain, hey, uh, we're sick of the taxation, we want representation, we want kind of self-rule and some self-governance here. But what they were really fighting for in this early stage of the war was to secure their rights as Englishmen. So that's a really um, kind of important contextual element. All right, so let's talk about Arnold's March and um, we'll talk about uh, um, kind of how it's talked about in uh, history books, right? And so the fancy word for that is historiography. Um, so the Arnold expedition, as you probably all know, is talked about in two kind of common tropes in the literature. So there's one uh, group of literature that, you know, praises Arnold and its leadership, and he's able to, you know, get the men up by their bootstraps and, and do this mission. And, and, and it was really, um, uh, a lot of early historians compare him to um, Hannibal crossing the Alps and all kinds of things like that, right? And then the other side of the coin, kind of the newer literature, the social history of the military really looks at the privation and suffering of common soldiers in the wilderness, right? So those are the two main veins in the literature regarding Arnold's expedition. But that's if it's even talked about at all. So most um, larger studies of the American Revolution ignore it altogether. In fact, I, doing my research, um, uh, I even found some books about the American Revolution in Maine that dedicate a paragraph to Arnold's March. And I said, what's this curious? Um, uh, why is it ignored? Well, part of the reason it, it, it's ignored is it doesn't result in anything for the victors of the American Revolution, right? It's a, it's a lost battle. Um, so typically American historians generally um, ignore it. And a lot of Canadian historians pick things up after the American Revolution. So when they're talking about um, um, the history of Canada, that is where they uh, tend to begin in a lot of their um, bigger studies. So there was no real major uh, strategic consequences for both sides other than the British kind of pushes back this American, um, American tide. All right, so because I was jealous, y'all uh, uh, talked about Arundel last week, I figured I'd talk about Kenneth Roberts a little bit before I, uh, before I dive in. So Arundel is a really, uh, really interesting piece of um, historical fiction that's written, um, I think he, uh, Kenneth Roberts wrote it in the 1930s. And in his research for Arundel, he actually goes to great lengths. He goes to all of these archives at, at um, Harvard. He talks to all of these people about um, uh, who have diaries of the Arnold expedition. He compiles them in this book called March to Quebec um, that has all kinds of the um, all kinds of the diaries of uh, Arnold's March. And that was my first introduction to this whole topic. So I, I really owe Kenneth Roberts, I think, a great debt to introducing me to this topic through both Arundel and 
um, from March to Quebec. Now, Arundel, of course, is historical fiction. So uh, Kenneth Roberts takes a lot of um, creative liberties, right, with his um, uh, with his characters, with his narrative, with his timing of events. Um, there's a lot of key figures that are curiously admitted in, in Robert's uh, book, too. So we don't really get a sense of George Washington's leadership or, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson crafting the Declaration of Independence or John Adams drumming up that foreign support or, or Ben Franklin's diplomacy. And we really don't get an, a sense of some of the other big figures in, um, in the American Revolution from a military standpoint. So like Nathaniel Green, Horatio Gates. Philip Schuyler, or even on the Canadian side of things or the British side of things, like um, Governor um, Guy Carlton. And then one thing that actually occurs in a lot of the literature around Arnold's campaign is there's a lot of um, anach an anachronisms that um, people use. So if you've read a lot of the literature around Arnold's March, a lot of people use Quebecois um, for the Canadian or the habitant um, population, but actually the term Quebecois doesn't come around until the 20th century. So that's kind of a, a misplaced, uh, misplaced term there. Um, Roberts also, um, he, he engages in a little bit of stereotyping and bias, so he really views Arnold as like this opportunistic and villainous character, um, and he depicts like the Franco and indigenous um, populations in sort of romanticized, um, romanticized kind of ways. Um, but I, like I said, I owe a great debt to um, Roberts and his work um, and uh, the research he did um, in writing uh, writing a bundle. And I did see some hands on the March to Quebec book. One of the things that Roberts is actually kind of famous for um, amongst historians is he talks about how a lot of the diaries of Arnold's March is probably forgeries, but I would like to push back against that. Um, so I went to a lot of archives throughout um, um, Ottawa and Boston and Philadelphia in New York, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, um, Connecticut, Concord, New Hampshire, and read uh, um, exhaustively the, the extant diaries for, um, for Arnold's March. And actually I had a professor who um, had a uh, fellowship in Glasgow, Scotland, and there's actually four diaries that are in the archive over there. I don't know how they got over uh, to Scotland, but I was able to get prints of those. So I exhaustively read almost all of the diaries that exist for um, Arnold's campaign. And so as y'all are thinking about Arnold's March, um, I figured it'd be good to have some context about how diaries are actually composed. So this is an actual picture from the archives of a diary. Uh, it takes forever to read them. Um, most of the time they're smeared or they're stained. Um, the ink has run. Uh, we do not write this way anymore, uh, typically, but so it's hard to uh, get at the penmanship. And then it's even interesting, like some of the common soldiers were rather poor um, uh, entering the war effort. Paper's really expensive, right? So a lot of the officers had these nice, like uh, uh, some nice paper to write on, but some of the common soldiers, their diary was actually written on their math homework. So they had like arithmetic primers um, and they flipped them over and they say, hey, I'm gonna bring this paper with me in case something cool happens while I'm gone. And then that's what they write their diaries on. So diaries actually aren't composed while they're marching, right? Um, so it'd be erroneous to think that you know, every hour or two, they're checking into their diary, um, writing something down, right? So diaries are written at night around the campfire usually, right? So they're a communal event. And they're a way for soldiers to kind of communicate with one another. So Roberts felt that some of the diaries were forgeries because um, they would mention things that there's no way that person could have seen, like when a tree fell on somebody and killed them, or when um, somebody was actually murdered in camp, like outside of um, uh, Skowhegan area, actually. Um, so um, he said, well, this can't be real, right? This person just ripped this other person off. But instead, I would like to say, you know, uh, these diaries are written kind of communally, and they're taking things from each other, because diaries are typically written for posterity's sake, right? So what do I want my grandkids to know about this conflict? What do I want my kids to know about this? You know, um, 30 years from now, what do I want to remember about this, right? So they're kind of writing down what's interesting to them, not everything that happens 
um, along the way. And then diaries also, like um, uh, a lot of the officers' diaries are written while they're in prison. So while they're going through the wilderness, they're taking kind of field notes and little sketches about how long they marched and, and what the conditions were like and things like that, and then little notes of what happened. And then they craft them into diaries while they're prisoners of war in Quebec. Um, so that's kind of an interesting um, means of how these diaries are actually composed and um, kind of talking about the authenticity of them. All right, so let's jump into what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about this evening, and that is the interesting intersections between military and environmental history that you can pull out of these various um, diaries. So for context, um, most people think that the that wilderness appreciation is sort of, sort of comes out of Henry David Thoreau, right? In the mid 19th century, that Thoreau's really the godfather of appreciating the landscape. Um, and so my dissertation and my master's thesis kind of argued that no, like, you know, um, um, 50 years, 60, 70 years before Thoreau, that Thoreau is a historical artifact in and of himself, and that Americans were appreciating the wilderness long before that. So Abner Stocking is a private in the Continental Army. He's also, he's kind of an interesting uh, fellow, because he's actually a privateer as well, so he's like this pirate kind of, uh, pirate kind of guy, so he's kind of a, a rough, hard, hard scrabble kind of guy. But about 248 years ago, in the middle of the Maine wilderness, Abner Stocking scratches in his diary, I encamped in a most delightful wood where I thought I could have spent some time agreeably in solitude, in contemplating the works of nature. The forest was stripped of its verdure, but still appeared to me beautiful. I thought that we were in a thick wilderness, uninhabited by human beings, yet we were as much in the immediate presence of our divine protector as in the crowded city. And I'll come back to this and analyze it a little bit um, later, but this passage really complicates our prevailing narrative about the Arnold's March, right? That the men basically was dragged through the wilderness and suffered, and it was just all suffering all the time. So despite this hunger, death, disease that was occurring, that wilderness actually could be a source of pleasure for those who are serving on Arnold's March. So I read this as a young um, uh, uh, environmental historian who was also interested in the American Revolution. And I said, I'm gonna pull on this thread. I'm gonna see what, you know, what else is going on? Um, what else is going on with all this? So this, um, this really adds a new understanding, what I'm going to talk about tonight, to um, the invasion of Canada, our understanding of how 18th century soldiers interacted with the landscapes that they, um, that they were um, uh, serving in, and also how 18th century Americans view um, the wilderness and uh, other environments altogether. So when reading the diaries of Arnold's, of the soldiers of Arnold's March, one really gains a sense that revolutionary era um, soldiers experience their surroundings in many different ways. So sensually, aesthetically, uh, materially, and even scientific. And I'm going to unpack um, kind of each one of those in the talk. What's more provocative from a social history standpoint is that this complex relationship with nature actually permeated um, through everybody, right? So the, uh, the stalking passage is from a private soldier, but also officers are talking about this well. So it's transcending things like age, education, um, rank, social classes, and things like that. And the exciting thing for me doing this research was that basically environmental historians have ignored military matters altogether. So this was kind of a new take on um, a topic that has been studied for um, about 250 years, right? Um, since the Arnold Expedition, Arnold Expedition occurred. So why is the soldiers doing this? What is the purpose of them cataloging, uh, cataloging the wilderness? So in their diaries, the men of the expedition catalog flora and fauna to provide order to the chaotic landscapes they're traveling to and to sharpen their ability to obtain food and forage from the natural world. 
They describe their surroundings in romantic terms, and they really view nature um, in, as a major obstacle to military success. And throughout their journey, the agency of the land is paramount as tension builds between the soldiers' fascination with the raw nature they're encountering and their need to survive in it. So to understand why they felt compelled to record this in their diaries, right? So the purpose of writing diaries is for posterity's sake, or um, what you uh, what you find interesting or what you find new, right? It's necessary to understand what wilderness means to them initially. So what are the early passages in these diaries, and how do they talk about the natural world? So what does the wilderness mean to them? So Private George Morrison, upon departing a settlement just north of Fort Western, so actually around uh, present-day Skowhegan, he states that the expedition um, were required, quote, to exchange the luxuriant and helpful plains of Cambridge for the inhospitable and dismal regions to the north, to leave delightful fields for barren wildernesses, verdant meadows and enlivening streams for miry marshes and stagnant ponds, and the habitants of men for the haunts of wild beasts. Captain Simon Thayer noted that he was, quote, in the midst of a frightful wilderness, habited by ferocious animals of all sorts, without the least sign of human trace. So the idea here is that wilderness is a place without human beings, right? And um, this is really exemplified. So Ensign James Knowles, I found a letter um, at the Massachusetts Historical Society that he writes to his wife. And in the closing, he says, I'm at newfound land on the Dead River. So to them, this was a landscape that nobody else had encountered. It was without human um, uh, without human habitation, um, and thus it's kind of an empty vessel. There's no culture in a place without human beings, right? So this is kind of how they describe the wilderness at the beginning, and as they travel through it, they find ways to fill it with meaning. So to overcome their misgivings about this amorphous landscape, Arnold and his men begin to impose order on it by systematically listing the flora and fauna, the plants and animals, that they end up encountering along the way. So Arnold describes the wilderness landscape as, quote, in general, fertile, intolerably well-wooded with some oak, beech, maple, pine, hemlock, etc." Private John Joseph Henry compared the trees of Maine to those in his home in Pennsylvania, writing, quote, the timber trees of this country are in great measure different from those in our own Pennsylvania. Here are neither oaks, hickories, poplars, maples, or locusts, but there's a great variety of other kinds of excellent timber, such as white and yellow pine, hemlock, cedar, cypress, and all the various species of firs. So recording this natural history makes the landscape of Maine familiar, right? They're trying to figure out what is um, this, this landscape that I'm encountering, and they're comparing it to stuff they know, right? Their home. So this mental comparison of sorting the familiar from the unfamiliar really aids the expedition in uh, navigating the unknown. So they catalog animals in a lot uh, different way. Um, they really only uh, catalog animals when they kill them for, um, for food or some sort of other subsistence. So it's a much more utilitarian approach to how they deal with, um, how they deal with animals. And this makes sense because um, they're writing about survival in this inhospitable, uh, inhospitable landscape. Um, there are some exceptions to this, though. So on October 12, Arnold notes that there had been, quote, plenty of moose and other game on the river. End quote. Expedition, expedition surveyor John Pierce described the Kennebec River as containing, quote, salmon and trouts, rivers full of fish, plenty of beaver, minks, and otter, uh, with some fowls such as geese, gulls, ducks, etc. So these passages suggest that soldiers in the expedition saw wilderness as kind of lush and providential. There's all kinds of things to harvest, um, all kinds of things to eat. And the value they attach to certain elements in this unfamiliar landscape kind of builds confidence in the expedition's ability to navigate and even survive in what they termed uh, a howling wilderness. <clears throat> 
So once the wilderness is ordered, um, reference points are established, they get a lot more comfortable in the Kennebec Chaudière corridor, and they start really successfully navigating it. Um, the rivers they travel upon end up becoming sources of provisions, um, kind of an unexpected bounty that they end up receiving from the environment. Um, so by recording the natural history of rivers, the expedition begins um, anticipating places where fishing um, becomes successful. So the wilderness becomes much more predictable and much more reliable. So soldiers found that fishing was best at the foot of waterfalls. So Private Stocking wrote that, quote, at the foot of Hellgate's Falls, him and his compatriots found fine fishing for salmon trout, end quote. As the expedition portaged around larger falls and moved across watersheds, they found that small ponds were also fecund fisheries. Camping next to one of these ponds, Captain Simeon Bayer noted in his journal that it was, quote, full of trout, which we caught plenty, end quote. Indeed, Arnold noted in his diary, quote, we caught a prodigious number of very fine salmon trout, nothing being more common than a man taking eight or ten dozen in one hour's time, which generally weigh half a pound apiece. <laughs> so these fish really become an unexpected bounty from the wilderness of Maine. And according to Dr. Isaac Center, Maine has, quote, the tastiest trout I've ever consumed. <laughs> And then the waterway corridors are also watering holes to Maine's uh, kind of megafauna here, right? Uh, the, the moose. Um, and this becomes really prized for, for the expedition. Moose actually were so ubiquitous in the, mid, in the beginning portion of the expedition that Private John Joseph Henry described, quote, my canoe having sunk deep into the water by the weight of our venison. Um, so they talk about over and over that their bateau, that their canoes are actually buckling and taking on water and being swamped out because they have four, five, six hundred pounds worth of moose meat in their uh, canoes. By October 13th, a little over one week after commencing their journey into the wilderness, the men of Meg's division had, quote, killed four moose, which is excellent meat, end quote. The members of the expedition were really curious about moose and they write about them over and over and over again as they try to understand um, what, uh, what a moose could be uh, used for. And they describe them in great detail. So Private George Morrison, kind of in a mix of curiosity and utility, describes moose as, quote, large as a common horse. The males have horns commonly four feet long and six or seven inches broad, edged like a saw. They are of a dun color, have a head, much like an ass, and it is said that these animals are a species of the reindeer found in the same latitude in the north of Russia. Lieutenant William Humphrey wrote that, quote, my men had killed a moose. The skin appeared to me to be as big as that of an ox that would weigh 600 pounds. This is the same species of, of the reindeer and would be of the same service to the inhabitants of this country as the reindeer is to the Laplanders in the upper Norwegians. So this was a bit of a head scratcher to me because I'm not overly familiar with 18th century Russia, Finland, and Norway. So I had to do some digging here and figure out historically, how do these places use moose Kind of like, uh, or how they use reindeer, how they use caribou, well, in similar ways to what is pictured in these kind of stage photographs, uh, fun photographs about moose um, that are supposedly hauling timber, but uh, both of these uh, photos actually have been proven to be uh, uh, kind of staged. Um, so caribou were used by these cultures to supplement their diets, um, so it's obviously a rich source of protein. They also get clothing, um, uh, they get their hides, they craft tools from their bones and antlers. However, interestingly enough in these cultures, reindeer were also, quote, employed as draft animals in these regions beginning in the 16th century. So when they were talking about the moose, they were envisioning the moose as plowing fields, as being hooked up to a plow, as being kind of a beast of burden. Um, so this really shows in their mind, they're thinking about settlement of this area eventually, right? Smaller game is also, uh, also became standard fare of the expedition. So Captain Simon Thayer noted on October 29th that, quote, this night we had the good fortune to kill a partridge of which we made a good soup for some supper, end quote. 
As provisions began running low, Private James Melvin was pleased to record that, quote, I shot a small bird called a seti, I'm not really sure what that is, and a squirrel, which I lived upon this day. The men also foraged for flora, so Private Henry noted that, quote, we discovered and ate a delicious species of cranberry. So they, uh, they are, are using the smaller animals as well as a kind of um, supplement their diet. So in addition to providing food to supplement the ever dwindling food stores of the expedition, right, we know that a lot of the bateaux crash, they lose their flour, it gets spoiled, um, so they don't have uh, all of the provisions that they uh, set out with. So in addition to providing food, um, the wilderness also supplies medicine and materials to repair clothing and watercraft. So on October 25th, Captain Henry Dearborn, quote, was seized with a violent headache and fever. In the wilderness bestowed upon him herbs in the woods, which were boiled into a tea for my relief. I drank very hearty of it, and the next morning felt much better, end quote. Private John Joseph Henry noted in his journal that the balsam fir had healing properties as well. It sat, quote, was healing and cordial to the stomach and preventing the, prevented the men from being assailed with sickness and, dys and dysentery, end quote. These folk remedies were really specific to the region and likely it seems from when these occur in the diaries that it was either provided by the local guides like the Getchels or by um, their other guides. So they had a lot of indigenous guides um, with them on the, um, on the expedition as well. Upon being mishandled and dropped, one of the canoes of Dearborn's company was split open. The men hauled the broken canoe up on the river bank Quote, it was brought to the fire and placed in the proper posture for operation. The lacerated parts were neatly brought together and sewed with cedar root. A large ridge of pitch, as is customary in the, con um, the construction of this kind of watercraft, was laid over the seam to make it watertight. Over the seam, a patch of strong bark, a foot in width, and a blank sufficient to encircle the bottom, was sewed down at the edges and pitched. After drying the canoe near the fire, the canoe was once ready again to use for transportation of men and provisions through the wilderness. Nature also supplied them with materials to fix their shoes. After wearing out the heel of his shoes from marching through the wilderness and having the seam burst, uh, John Joseph Henry had to either fix the problem or go barefoot the rest of the way to Quebec. He noted, quote, bark, the only substitute for twine or leather in this miserable country, was immediately procured and the shoe was bound tightly to my foot. The wilderness also provides the troop with kind of um, uh, a mental reprieve. So they talk a lot about the wilderness aesthetic um, that they encounter along the way. And it piques their curiosity, it distracts them from the rigors of the passage, the terrors of isolation, and all of the negative things that they are experiencing. On October 14th, Arnold described his surrounding as, quote, very beautiful and noble, with a high chain of mountains encircling a pond, which is deep, clear, and fine water, over which a forked mountain, which they were at uh, Mount Bigelow at this point in time, uh, and you can see there the, uh, the, the dip that um, Arnold is talking about, um, over which the Fork Mountain, which exceeds the rest in height, bears northwest and covered with snow, in contrast with the others, adds greatly to the beauty of the scene. End quote. Private John Joseph Henry and Do Dr. Isaac Center commented on Mount Bigelow, Bigelow as well. Henry noted that, quote, several of these mountains seem to stand on insulated bases, and one in particular formed the most beautiful cone of an immense height. End quote. Center, apparently surprised by the scene before his eyes, wrote that, quote, this is a very beautiful situation for the wilderness, a large mountain bordering boldly on the northwest with more at a greater distance to the south and the southwest. And then they talk about other landscapes they encounter um, as well. So several days after passing through this mountainous terrain, the expedition, quote, came to an Indian wigwam located on pastoral land um, and so Henry Dearborn um, is talking about this, uh, Captain Henry Dearborn. And he writes, quote, it stands on a point of land beautifully situated. There's a number of acres cleared about it. 
The river is very still here, and the land is good on each side of it, a, a considerable part of the way. So it's really interesting. Um, so Dearborn is a wealthy physician at the time of the um, at the time of the American Revolution, and he's likely thinking about um, settling this landscape after uh, after the war. So Dearborn is actually a native of New Hampshire, and he really knew firsthand that New England's in a demographic crunch at this point in time. So quite often, you know, you would um, you would have your land going back several generations, but then when you pass your land down, it's divided. And then you pass your land down and it's divided again. So you have uh, various generations that have subdivided land plots. In New England was really at a point where people either had to move westward or they were going to have to settle, uh, settle the region of Maine. And in fact, Dearborn actually becomes an avid uh, land speculator and serves as um, uh, James Bowden, who was the proprietor of uh, Kennebec, uh, actually. Um, so he's the Kennebec proprietor for land after the war. Um, he becomes his land agent. So this is a really neat connection between his experience in the war and then his ability um, to make a living as a land speculator after. And so I told you we'd be back to uh, Abner Stockton's quote here. So other soldiers, um, so mostly privates, who wouldn't uh, turn to land speculation or something like that after the war, also commented on the beauty of the landscape. So after reaching a particularly agreeable stretch of land on the journey to Quebec, um, private Abner Stockton is absolutely captivated by his beautiful surroundings. Um, so he notes at sundown, his division encamped in the most delightful wood, um, and I'll let you read the quote where I, uh, where I already had. And so present in this passage is what historian Perry Miller calls, quote, Christianized nat naturalism, where Abner Stocking, who is a private from Connecticut, um, serving in the Continental Army, could appreciate the romance and indeed the divinity of the natural world, seeing what Perry Miller calls um, sermons and stones. Um, so connecting the wildness of this region to religion is yet another way that um, soldiers are able to find comfort and solace in an unknown and foreboding um, landscape. In another passage, Stocking um, expresses a reaction approaching the sublime. He says, quote, Hellgate's Falls, which is of an astonishing height, and exhibits an awful appearance. So that's kind of that, that um, being wowed by nature, right? So that's the idea, the idea of the sublime. While approaching the spine of mountains between Maine and Quebec, Private John Joseph Henry is sailing in his bateau across the pond and then through the opening in the trees, he and the other enlisted soldiers, quote, obtained a full view of the hills of which were called the height of land. It made an impression on us that was really more chilling than the air which surrounds us. So here we kind of get an idea that they're, they're viewing these uh, beautiful landscapes and kind of getting goosebumps by them, right? Um, and so this is really the true essence of the sublime is encountering landscapes that kind of take your breath away, right? So the grandeur of the hills before them really inspires Fire feelings of awe, of the wilderness, and their need to overcome its transcendent power. And countless other soldiers express their awe and reverence of serpentine streams and rivers, very fine and beautiful lakes and ponds, the stillness of the early mornings in the wilderness. Um, they talk about the serenity they experience at dawn. They talk about the beautiful meadows, the groves of birch woods. Um, and so you really get a sense from them, uh, this, this sense of wilderness appreciation in this beautiful landscape in Western Maine. And it really becomes a point for them of kind of rejuvenation in this state of starving. Um, they are writing this. And in fact, Dr. Isaac Center, who at one point in time hadn't had anything to eat in three days, and then he writes something very similar to this in his diary about his appreciation for the landscape. So it's really kind of food for the soul uh, for them where they didn't have other 
uh, other food. And then I really like the wilderness of scientific inquiry. They, they really try to make sense of some of the unique things they encounter. Uh, it's pretty funny. Um, so not only um, you know, do they appreciate aesthetic qualities, but they also like the odd and interesting as well and try to make scientific sense of it. So Major Meggs um, uh, mused about the rocks that he encountered on the edge of the river. He says, quote, these are polished curiously in some places. Uh, the expedition surveyor Pierce um, noted the heaps of stones that were scattered all along several parts of the rivers. And so he starts talking to the Getchels about this, the guides, and he says, what, what is going on here? Why are all these stones um, kind of lined up along the river? And uh, they kind of uh, pull his leg a little bit and they say, quote, they, those were carried there by ye salmon and ye trouts, uh, end quote. <laughs> um, and then a curious rock catches John Joseph Henry's eye as the expedition rode past it. Um, he says, quote, this rock is standing in canonical form, five feet in perpendicular height, scalloped out down to the water's edge. So the expedition guides have um, something for this too. So John Getchell, one of the guides told him, this is where the Abenaki Indians were harvesting their arrowheads. And so Henry actually has an internal dialogue about this in his diary. And he's like, eh, I don't know if this is accurate. And then after a while, he says, I really can't make any other sense of this. So he's probably not, uh, not, uh, not pulling my leg here. So it's, that also gives us an idea about John Getchell a little bit too, um, as being maybe somebody who's pulling people's legs along the expedition and having fun with these guys from uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Boston area that's really quite settled by this point in time. Um, you know, we think about expedition soldiers as being like these farmers with their mother's tablecloth, but a lot of them are from urban or um, really uh, uh, well-developed areas um, by, this, uh, by this point in time. And then they're really fascinated with the Dead River. They're fascinated by the stillness of the Dead River and the privates and um, uh, officers alike write in their diaries about this. And Private Jeremiah Greenman, whose diary is a mess, it's, it's illegible in most places, um, but he writes, quote, the water is just so still, you can't but just perceive which way it runs. It's black and very deep. And so we can kind of view these soldiers um, in very similar ways to uh, American naturalists. So uh, Dr. Richard Judd, who um, used to be a professor at the University of Maine, has a book um, titled Untilled Garden, The Natural History and Spirit of Conservation in America, 1740 to 1840. And he looks at these um, wilderness explorers that are going out in the environment and trying to make sense of the West, but we really see our, the soldiers of Arnold's expedition as doing something very similar. So Judd writes about these early American explorers, quote, they used their feeling to give meaning to a land that carried no established Western cultural associations, where nature itself seemed formless and confusing. Judd continues by pointing out that these early explorers um, really used emotional reactions to ascent the wilderness landscape. Um, and that once they were able to ignore the biting flies and let some of the confusion, confusing parts about landscapes um, sort themselves out, they used the language of emotion to convey the beauty and majesty of the wilderness. So we really, I argue that the men of Arnold's expedition is kind of an early form of this that um, um, Americans during the 18th century, mid to late 18th century, really had a great appreciation for the wilderness um, landscape far before some of the 19th century um, explorers like Audubon or maybe um, you know, romantic writers such as Emerson and Thoreau and um, people like that, right? Okay, so this makes kind of an interesting campfire story or like an intriguing uh, argument about environmental history, but is there really any military value um, to what I talked to you about um, tonight? And so, yes, there is um, that the enlisted men and the commanding officers actually become better soldiers through this unique interface with the main wilderness. And it's kind of hard to tease out through the sources immediately, but when you look at the longer duration of the Northern Campaign of the American Revolution, you kind of see that. So focusing in on the soldiers' immediate reactions, 
Um, and then we'll get into kind of a broader picture uh, of things. So first, the soldiers become really adept at finding moose tracks. And multiple times, they complained in their diaries about their canoes and their bateau being swamped out because of how much moose meat they have, right? Second, they find small ponds, pools, waterfalls, things like that, places where they can harvest fish and a whole lot of fish, right? Um, catching enough food for multiple days. Um, then they figure out, oh, angling in the morning before the expedition starts or in the evening. We're able to supplement our food stores. We're able to supplement our breakfast and then our dinner. So they're able to kind of um, reinforce their dwindling food stores with what they're able to get from um, the environment. So they actually learn to partially subsist off the resources of the main wilderness. So Private Caleb Haskell has a really good quote in his diary about this um, uh, interfacing with the environment of Maine um, and the experience of portaging cumbersome bateau through the wilderness. So he writes simply, about well, halfway through the expedition, he says, quote, we are learning to become soldiers, end quote. So he's not talking about drill, he's not talking about arms practice, but for Caleb Haskell, um, and we can kind of infer for other privates on this march that becoming a soldier on Arnold's expedition to Quebec meant learning to fight against the harsh environment of the main wilderness and learning how to survive within that wilderness. The commanding officers also learned lessons from the Arnold expedition right up the chain, chain of command to General Washington himself. So if one looks through the um, uh, multi-volume collection of the papers of George Washington, and you analyze around 1775 in the expedition to Quebec, he really gathers very little, if any, intelligence about Maine. Um, by and large, he outsources his um, intelligence gathering um, to local individuals. So the guides like the Getchels, or by Reuben Colburn, who's the guy who made the, made the bateau, right? Um, so he really outsources all of that to other people. But about four years later, uh, Washington concocts an expedition out of eastern Pennsylvania to invade um, Iroquois. So this is that area of upstate New York by the Finger Lakes, um, where the Seneca are. And so by that time, he is obsessed with learning everything he can about every inch of the route that Sullivan would take. So by the beginning of 1778, he's making general inquiries about how to execute the mission. He writes to General Horatio Gates and asks, quote, what troops you have in contemplation for the expedition into the country of the Seneca? What number you conceive adequate to the service? What are your prospects of supplying them with provisions? What are your prospects with supplying them with stores and other necess ne necessaries? And with what convenience and readiness the means of transportation can be provided. So he learns his lesson about uh, kind of the Greenwood Bateau that Arnold's using. And he's really kind of curious about this. And then he starts writing to everybody in the area. So Philip Schuyler, uh, General um, Gates, um, local elites he knows in upstate New York. And he starts asking about, quote, the face of the country. Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it level? Is it broken? How furnished is it with herbage? And then he even wants to know details at a more micro level. So he asks about, quote, the rapidity and depth of the water, and if there are even, quote, fallen trees in the rivers. So Washington really, letter after letter after letter after letter, inquires to anybody who will listen about the state of the wilderness landscape between East and Pennsylvania in Iroquois. And this is a stark difference from the Washington um, who is getting uh, general contractors ready for the expedition to Quebec. So it's very clear that Washington has learned his lesson about um, conducting wilderness, uh, wilderness campaigns. So to conclude, our soldiers here can be viewed in many ways as amateur naturalists, right? Um, and that his men, Arnold's men, were completely engaged with their natural surroundings. 
And to make the wilderness less imposing and more useful, the soldiers embarked on a desperate quest to understand their surroundings, impose some sort of order and predictability on the wilderness landscape. And this makes the wilderness more useful, more reliable as a source of food, and less threatening as a gateway to Quebec. Additionally, their diaries um, reveal a near irrepressible, irrepressible sense of curiosity, reverence, and awe, not unlike um, the reactions of many romantic uh, writers and romantic artists of the coming decades. This is not necessarily to say that continental soldiers were proto autobahns, right? However, they're also not um, uh, the, the frightened Puritans that are encountering, encountering a wilderness where they are um, seeing Satan around every corner, around every tree, right? Um, so they're much more comfortable in the wilderness and much more able to appreciate um, the wilderness um, than the Puritans were, or um, in, in ways that um, historians had not prior to, uh, prior to appreciated. So the soldiers of Arnold's March kind of occupied the space in between, right? So their ideas about the American wilderness were transitioning, right, from fear to reverence, um, kind of like the nation itself was transitioning into um, enlightenment modernity and independence from Britain. Thanks. Mm -hmm.